the first data of this uh, randomized trial, which was finished in February this year and was presented as late breaking clinical trial at the ACC in New Orleans. So these are very new data, and I'm happy to share them with you. This uh, slide depicts um, disclosure information for this trial. Um, as you all know, and we have discussed this um, in the last two days so, uh, since yesterday a couple of times, the incidence of cardiogenic shock is between 6 and 8 percent, a little bit depending on the definition you use uh, in patients with acute myocardial infarction. So a lot of patients coming to our hospitals um, will come with this problem. and. Uh, we, we discussed this um, again, over and over again, that hospital mortality is very, very high. Over the last 20 years, we were successful in reducing hospital mortality from over 75% down to 60%. And of all the treatment options we use, and we hope to uh, use them successfully, only uh, aggressive reperfusion therapy with PTCA in this time um, has been demonstrated in a randomized trial to uh, reduce mortality from 63 to 50 percent. And so in, in our days, in 2002, um, we published our data in, in Munich with stenting, with all the antithrombotic drugs we use in our days, and we still have a mortality of 46 percent in patients with this problem. So we still face a um, a huge problem in, a, in, a, in, in a thousands of patients uh, worldwide. Uh, the background for this study is that we try to support the failing heart mechanically, and intraortic balloon counterpulsation is recommended for patients with a class 1B. And we discussed this uh, again over and over that um, the evidence for this uh, treatment is at best marginal. We have no randomized trials which really prove to uh, benefit these patients. And um, so we use it all. We hope that it's um, useful, but uh, the data from randomized trials are still missing. There are few randomized studies comparing intraortic balloon pump with a left ventricular assist device. And uh, previous studies investigating, for example, the tandem heart, as in peripheral VAD, revealed high complication rates of bleeding and limp ischemia. And the people here in the room who used it um, will probably share this um, um, opinion. So we, we used the Impella LP 2.5 as a hopefully better uh, system to uh, improve hemodynamics in these patients. And the study hypothesis we used and we designed uh, two years ago was that implantation of an LVAD in pillar 2.5 provides a hemodynamic improvement compared to intraortic balloon counterpulsation in patients with cardiogenic shock due to a myocardial infarction. And we designed uh, patients with acute myocardial infarction. We, we uh, had to have uh, initial hemodynamic measurement for randomization. We uh, randomized for 26 patients, 13 in each group, and the primary endpoint was hemodynamic measurement after 20 minute support. And of course, we looked for secondary endpoints as there are safety and efficacy during hospital stay and, of course, mortality after 30 days. This sample size was estimated based on an increase of cardiac index in patients with the interaortic balloon pump of 0.15 liter per minute per square inch is after 20 minute support, and an estimated increase of cardiac index with an impeller pump of 0.5 liter per minute per square inch after 20 minute support. And with an alpha level of 5% and power of 80%, we could go for 26 patients. The inclusion criteria um, are very much the same as, for example, in the shock trial. We had acute myocardial infarction. Uh, not only ST elevation infarction, but uh, some si uh, sign of, of um, CK um, and, and uh, myocardial infarction um, shorter than 48 hours. Clinical criteria of cardiogenic shock, uh, more or less classic clinical criteria, and uh, the, um, or the need for positive inotropic drugs to maintain a blood pressure higher than 90 millimeter mercury and end organ hyperperfusion as, for example, low urinary output. 
and hemodynamic criteria defined as either cardiac index more than 2.2 liter per minute per square meters or an EF lower than 30 percent in this situation, each with a measurement which um, uh, made it sure that we didn't have a low volume problem in these patients. Exclusion criteria were only um, a very long resuscitation or some problems to place this um, new device like hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, thrombus in the left ventricles, or a severe valvular disease or mechanical heart valve. So we try to get all these patients. Um, we usually um, think will benefit of an intraortic balloon pump. The baseline clinical characteristics in our study were the following. We had a patient group between 64 and 66 years old with uh, diabetes, anterior myocardial infarction of 40 to 50 percent. And this, um, as I heard some, or some speakers talking about the time from acute myocardial infarction to randomization, I think this is um, quite well fitting in this picture that it needs some time to develop this cardiogenic shock. So patients came to us five to eight hours um, from acute myocardial infarction. Um, and we had um, very well matched uh, LV ejection fraction, free vessel disease. We went for PCI and more or less all of these patients, just one patient went immediately to the um, uh, operating room. And uh, um, more than 90% of our patients were mechanically ventilated and most of them had a CPR, VT, or VF before randomization, so very ill patients. Um, just go back. These were the baseline hemodynamic char uh, p characteristics um, from the beginning. Cardiac output were very, very well matched, uh, 3.2 liters per minute, or cardiac index of 1.71. Mean arterial pressure you see and heart rate. Um, and um, uh, all were very well matched, uh, filling pressures. And as you can see, the serum lactate of 7.1 or 6.4 millimole per liter and a pH of 7.28 or 7.24 in both groups demonstrated um, this critical situation. Um, the primary endpoint was, as I said, um, hemodynamic support after 20 minutes. Um, we chose this um, endpoint to be sure that we get this endpoint in hopefully all patients and we were happy to, do, to uh, succeed um, and not lose some patients on the way to this uh, primary endpoint um, at this very small study. At baseline, as I said, we had a very comparable um, uh, cardiac index value, and after 20 minutes uh, support, we had this uh, significantly different increase of, um, of hemodynamic support in these patients from impeller compared to uh, intraortic balloon pump, and demonstrated in a little bit different way. This is change of cardiac index from baseline, and you can see that either in cardiac index or in cardiac output, we could demonstrate a quite um, significant increase in change of cardiac index after 20 minutes of supports in these two randomized groups. Um, however, we did not reach, and I will discuss this a little bit in detail, the estimated additional 2.5 liter per minute, even although we supported as um, uh, with the maximum flow we could use in these patients. So P7, P8, uh, uh, if possible. The change of hemodynamic parameters or the different change are uh, demonstrated in this um, slide. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, stress um, the uh, difference in diastolic blood pressure. And all, we all know that it's one of the um, um, yeah, results of an intraortic balloon pump to decrease diastolic aortic uh, pressure. So this difference was uh, highly significant um, that the impeller device increased diastolic blood pressure in the intraortic balloon pump 
decreased, but we had a nearly um, significant difference, although in mean arterial pressure and systolic arterial pressure, as demonstrated in the first line. Um, you can see that we could decrease in both uh, groups a little bit uh, wedge pressure, more uh, in the impeller group, and uh, we could decrease um, um, the uh, peripheral resistance as, as well. Um, this slide I just uh, finished to um, to calculate, and uh, this is um, this is a, an attempt to uh, calculate what happens over the next 30 hours in these two groups with our patients. Uh, we calculated the cardiac power index um, by um, mm, uh, calculating the product of cardiac index and mean arterial pressure to get an idea what the heart uh, works um, over the next 30 hours in, this, in these patients. And um, you can see that um, in the intraortic balloon pump as well in, as in the impeller pump, the cardiac power um, increases over time as the heart recovers after procedures and uh, reperfusion and so on. Um, after 20 minutes, this difference was uh, significantly uh, different. Um, in the further end, uh, time points, um, it was not uh, restricted to leave everything the same. So some bias by the clinical change are coming into account at these time points. At 20 minutes, my investigators were forced to keep everything the same from baseline to 20 minutes after that. Uh, positive inotropic drugs were changed as clinical um, need was, was uh, uh, forced or volume um, was changed. So these differences a little bit uh, diminished over time. However, what, uh, uh, what I would like to stress at this uh, slide is when we calculate the amount of the impeller device um, um, doing some work in the patients with the impeller device, you see that um, one of the effects of this impeller device in our patients was that we could substitute um, the work of the heart or the work which had to be done for the circulation by the impeller device, substituting the work which was endogenously done by the heart. And although I don't know what that means at the end of the day, but, uh, for example, Dr. Enriquez will talk about um, an infarct size reduction or some, some hint that infarct size could be reduced um, by, um, by a mechanically support. And we can, we can, I think we can uh, use these data to uh, generate new hypotheses uh, for future studies, for future trials, um, what it means that we give the heart not only an additional support, but a time to recover and um, get the rid of uh, or get the work a little bit away from the heart for these next um, two, one or two days. Um, okay, what did it mean for the for the for the microperfusion and uh, in, and for the patients? These um, are the um, serum levels of le uh, lactate over the next 24 hours, and you, you can see that uh, pre-implantation uh, were very well matched. And afterwards, we had a, um, a lower uh, time course of serum lactate. However, it was not significantly different uh, due probably these small numbers. And after 24 hours, we had um, a decrease in, in uh, both groups. Um, um, of course, we were very, very aware of safety issues and we looked um, uh, in for these uh, two groups and we had one failure to implant um, the impeller in our patients. We had no technical failure, no mechanical complication, and no major bleeding and excess site um, defined, defined as the preliminary um, uh, explantation of the devices. However, we had one limb ischemia after explantation in our group with the impeller. And um, although we didn't um, uh, look for this or pre-specified it, uh, it was quite interesting to know right now after looking to all the uh, um, data that we had some change in uh, neurologic impairment and septic conditions in these two groups. 
maybe, maybe um, demonstrating that it's um, that we had a little bit better end organ perfusion in our patients with the impeller device, but that was not pre-specified and uh, is probably too early to conclude. Um, of course, we we heard that hemolysis had to be looked for, and we, um, we, uh, these are the levels of free hemoglobin, one of the very sensitive parameters to go for, um, for hemolysis in these patients. And we had a highly significant increase of hemolysis in these uh, patients with the impeller group, uh, which were run for 25 hours. Um, however, this median duration is a little bit biased by the patients who died before or who died um, under the support. Um, and, and I will demonstrate the mortality rates uh, later. Um, in, usually, we, we use the devices for two, three days. Um, that was so uh, what, what we like to do. Whether this is long enough, we heard about it um, the, last, the last talks. Uh, we can discuss, however, that was the hemolysis curves. And I would like to stress uh, that um, we, we demonstrated this hemolysis uh, with a peak after six hours, you lose some old um, red blood cells, and whenever they are gone, uh, probably hemolysis is no longer a big issue. Um, blood, blood transfusion during hospital stay uh, resulting by this hemolysis was um, not significantly changed, but you see we had a higher use of PET red blood cells uh, per patient per stay of 2.6 compared to 1.2 in our patients, as well as uh, uh, fresh frozen plasma 1.8 compared to 1.0. Um, no platelet uh, transfusion were necessary. So we had some hemolysis, but it was not a big issue. These are the 30-day survival rates. Unfortunately, we could not demonstrate uh, a difference. However, I think these numbers are too low to really um, conclude for an, uh, a survival uh, benefit in these patients. Um, and what we learned, and when I looked to all the other mortality curves of other cardiogenic shock trials, um, we have to face the fact that what, whatever patient group we include in these studies, we lose some patients in the first 24, 48 hours, and probably whatever we do. Um, because they come too late, they are too ill. And um, for the rest, we, um, we have to think of uh, what we can do. Um, and uh, probably um, we, we can demonstrate some benefit um, for clinical endpoints in, in future studies. So I would like to conclude that in our study and, and after our, uh, in our experience, the use of this cardiac assist device is feasible in more than 90% of our patients with cardiogenic shock. The impeller was a safe assist device. No technical failure was detected in, in both groups. Hemolysis was significantly increased during the first 24 hours. There was an increased use of uh, full blood packs and fresh frozen plasma packs in patients with impeller LP 2.5. And after 30 days, mortality was not different in patients treated with impeller compared with interotic balloon pump in this randomized trial. Um, the cardiac assist device provides a significantly increased cardiac index and increased mean arterial pressure after 20 minute support compared to interotic balloon pump in patients with cardiogenic shock due to myocardial infarction. And whether this demonstrated hemodynamic improvement results in better clinical outcomes should be tested in a larger study with longer follow-up. And that is what I would like to uh, propose, and we are just planning um, or going to plan uh, a second trial, which we would very much like to, to do with a community and uh, hopefully with a company, a prospective randomized multicenter trial to compare Impeller LP 2.5 with interaortic balloon pump in patients with maybe beginning cardiogenic shock, a little bit changed inclusion criteria after myocardial infarction. And a first very, very preliminary uh, calculation of, of the sample size would mean that we um, take patients' uh, inclusion based on hemodynamic and clinical criteria, and for a primary endpoint, which 
which should uh, be a composite and clinical endpoint in, in my um, uh, view uh, with a mortality, neurologic deficit, renal failure, etc., would mean that we need some patients of 200, 280 patients. That is more or less the amount we, we have to think of uh, in a second clinically important study. And I think it is time to go for these studies and to get really uh, good data to uh, tell the community what we can do for the patients. Thank you very much.